Why do you buy what you buy? Convenience, need, quality, price, or brand loyalty? From toilet paper to training services, as consumers, we always have multiple options to choose from when we buy. But in 2020, there has been an additional layer that is influencing how we buy the who and the why. So the only way they could eat. It was through the leave. More than ever, we are seeing by Black owned, by women owned, by LGBT owned, by small, by local, all those different components because they, that is what makes or breaks our community. That I'm excited about trying to do with Click Shop is being able to change the conversation and erase some of the stigma or overcoming the stereotype and what it looks like to be a Black man, especially a Black man that was in prison, especially a Black man that was in prison as a kid. And most importantly, A black man that has a family. Like a plastic bottle in their hands all the time because they're drinking water from it. Then everyone looks at them and say, if this guy who's the CEO of this super important company is drinking from a plastic bottle, then it shouldn't be so bad. And they go on Saturday to, I don't know, Costco or the supermarket with their families. And then they buy a box of plastic bottles. It is very clear from a sustainability perspective that people's habits are changing, that they are paying attention and moving towards more sustainable people products. People have started being a bit more aware of where their products are coming from. Some people have started reassessing what companies they choose to support. Hi, welcome to Dear Workplace by Innovators Box, where I study trends, changes, and challenges with people at work. I'm your host, Monica King. And today, I study how and why we buy is changing and how that impacts how we work. This episode was harder to put together when I thought because the more I dug deeper into the question why we care what we buy, the more layered and complicated I realized it was. It was a reminder to how connected our society is. Every individual decision. When it's multiplied, has a significant social economic impact. And depending on which side of the story you are in, this can be a good or scary news for you. Well, let's start with the most obvious ones. First, priority for safety and convenience. What we prioritize buying change because how we lived change. We're working from home longer, mask or new staples. It's understandable why there has been an increase in online purchasing, delivery services, groceries, and high priority for purchasing from businesses that practice safety. Especially at the beginning of the pandemic, I remember how happy and safe I felt when Trader Joe's was one of the first stores to insist customers to wear masks and practice six feet distance. Seeing them send customers away if they refuse to follow safety only made me. Feel safe to trust this brand. Return policies were also noticed. When I realized that I bought the wrong ice cream and went back for an exchange at Jenny's Splendid Ice Cream one day, the staff not only kindly accepted my request, but also shared how he can't take it back. Safety came first, so they had a rule of not taking back anything that left their store. I was impressed at how clearly the company valued customer service and safety. That someone who started work just two days ago had clarity in what to do without needing to ask a manager. At the same time, this very emphasis for safety, complemented with our fear of uncertainty, has led to bizarre moments like the shortage of toilet paper in April 2020. And dozens of container ships idling for as long as two weeks at the off coast of Los Angeles in March 2021. We're buying more than we used to, and as the New York Times article on March 6, 2021 says, our current shipping infrastructure is not able to keep up with it. Such events make me wonder how the more we care about safety and convenience, the more changes we may need in how we ship, build. And deliver one goods to one another. Customers will want even more safety and personalization and convenience after this, and it's a dot to wonder how much businesses today are preparing for its changing future versus reacting only temporarily. But safety isn't the only thing customers are caring about. People are recognizing how important our small and diverse businesses are to the economy. 
more than they, they, I think they just took it for granted before that it was, they were just another business. That's Heather Koch, co-founder of Diversity Mastermind, who helps diverse and small businesses grow by helping them understand the value of being a certified diverse business owner. And while she and her co-founder, Liz Whitehead, have been advocating for corporations and individuals to support more small and diverse businesses for a long time, they are finding how more people are caring now than before. I have a someone in my mastermind who owns a restaurant in Southern California. She was employing like 40 people. And from having people live in her house because they had to lose their jobs to like making sure they stayed open in some capacity because she had people's livelihoods at stake. So yes, the state of California is finding her right and left now, but like she made a conscious decision to support the people. I think now consumers, whether they be business consumers or personal consumers are realizing this is who is supporting our communities. In addition, with Black Lives Matter, George Floyd's murder and rise in Asian racism, more consumers become aware of how every dollar they spend has a ripple effect. And more are starting to ask, who are the diverse business owners and who are the small business owners in their neighborhoods to support? But what does local small business mean? And why does that matter? Right, so small business is, so typically it's the, sm the small business administration has defined what a small business is. There's still good sized businesses because usually the threshold is somewhere about 30 million in revenue um, and under makes a small business. But typically when we think about it, we think about um, companies that are a little bit smaller than that, probably 15 million and under, maybe 20 million and under in gross sales and um, you know have employees that live in our community. So local owned means somebody who lives and works and employs people from your community, from where you live. What are some examples in how individuals make a choice and buy small and buy local? So for example, across from our office, we have, or down the street, one way is a Starbucks and the other way is a small local owned company, okay? I really do try to go to that small local owned company because I know they hire from here, they're hiring people who live in my community. Now, Starbucks is not a bad option either because you know what, they have a phenomenal supplier diversity program. Starbucks they go out of their way to find to like every straw you get, all those green straws, those are diverse owned. Cake pops were started by a woman owned business that everyone eats up all the time. Like, there are amazing stories that Starbucks does out. But you know, I also want to support our, our local small business that is owned by somebody who lives and works and probably sends their kids to somewhere, some school locally where I live. That's powerful. What about from the corporation perspective? What does supplier diversity mean and why is that important? So we'll do, we'll do the 101. So supplier diversity is simply the buying of goods and services from companies that are owned by diverse individuals. And that generally means women, ethnic minorities, LGBT individuals, veterans, and people with disabilities. It's that simple. So whether we're talking about a supplier diversity manager or supplier diversity program at Bristol Myers Squibb, where they're looking to utilize sort of by diverse code companies or what we're buying in our own house from the shampoo we buy to the the gas we buy are we buying are we shopping intentionally or are we just shopping that last statement is key how often do you care to look up the company's values or founders when you buy something buying diversity and sustainably takes an intentional effort because we often don't ask who we are buying from we tend to care more about what we buy and at what price. And if we think about that Maslow's Pyramid, it's understandable why consumers cared more about price and durability first until they felt like their basic needs were met. It would be hard to think about which company my burger is from if I only had one price range to choose from. But this is why I find the shift to how we care more about the who during an economic downturn to be more intriguing. And it doesn't stop there. We're also caring a lot more about sustainability and systematic changes. So what I've seen even just from the time I've been back from our, my furlough is the incredible rise of interest in sustainability from our customers, from our, our own teams um, across the company saying like, I read about this while I was on furlough. I read all about composting. Tell me more. That's my I mean, friend, Denise Nagy. 
Vice President Sustainability and Supplier Diversity at Marriott International, and she's excited to see how more people are caring about sustainability than before. I asked her more how even global companies like Marriott, who have been leading sustainability for a long time, are taking more intentional action during this time. Luckily for us, Marriott has been on this journey for a long time and have had very clear efforts, goals, you know, values specifically rooted in this. But nobody's perfect, as our founder says. We, you know, success is never final, and so we absolutely paused and figured out what is it that we're not doing well enough, and opened the door for our associates to articulate their challenges. What are they seeing that's not working? Active listening. But listen to who? So the the trend was both from internal and external, really being more vulnerable, opening oneself up to be sort of accepting of the criticisms of the areas and gaps that we have, and then figuring out how do we solve for those? How are we going to work together to understand the again, kind of meeting people where they are? What about for individuals? What can they do to make a difference? Where do they start? So I think it starts, Monica, with understanding what your own values are, right? If you can't even sort of think about and say, okay, what matters to me, right? You have to you have to start there. Just like a company looks at their values and determines sort of their you know what's their true north, it's equally, if not more, important to do that as an individual. So back to your comment about you know the, your buying power, you need to understand first your own values. What matters to me? Do I want to actually? Support organizations that are diverse in nature. Do I want to support organizations and company and brands, etc., that are driving towards more sustainable change in the world? Value-based purchasing. This has already been growing, but now with all these movements, we're wanting it even more. I'm no longer buying from X or buying that product because of what they did. Right? We've seen it over and over again. Product bans and. You know, boycotts of products because people aren't sort of aligned with the values of those companies, right? It happens all the time. So I think if again, kind of back to the understanding your own values, if you know what those things are that sort of are meaningful to you, I mean, there's you know there are people who won't go to certain restaurants because they know, and the, those companies have made it really clear that they're anti-LGBT. Well, if that's important to you to make sure that there are equal rights in this world. You also should be making that connection, and then therefore making that decision. If you have that value, and you're like, "Yeah, I'm gonna have that value today, but not tomorrow, because tomorrow I want to eat there," that's sort of like a slippery slope, right? Because it's not actually then a value. So you know, if you, once you know, you got to do something about it. Do something about it. This is why I believe more people are caring what we buy right now more than ever. They are asking more who this is by, how it's made, and what the social implication is, and it's shifting how the supply chain is. Yes, we still got a lot more to improve upon in racism, diversity, and equitable opportunities. But the rise in value and who during COVID is inspiring. I asked how Denise feels about it. I'm grateful that the attention is there on both of those topics. I think it's sort of. <laughs> You know, it's an ab- about time. It's about time. Yes, it's about time we ask more about the who and the why before we buy anything. The next question, though, is of course, is this a temporary response or would we truly change forever? Time will tell. But for now, at least, I wonder: as you listen to today's episode, is this story a good news for you? Or scary news might be a good time to think about not only how you make but how you buy with care. Hey there, this is Ravi Lad, one of the audio engineers at Innovators Box. I hope you're enjoying Dear Workplace. A fun fact about me is that I'm also a petroleum engineer by trade and an online music production student at the Berkeley College of Music. Personally, I love the insights that Dear Workplace provides me into all of my professional and creative endeavors. This show is brought together by our awesome team: producer Saren O, audio engineer Sam Lamer, and myself; Kelly Gravo on marketing; website designer Akriti Pandey; graphic designer Monica Escobar, and Luke Helder on music. Dear Workplace is hosted and directed by Monica Kang, founder and CEO of Innovators Box. 
To continue the conversation of reimagining the workplace, visit us at innovatorsbox.com. Also, don't forget to subscribe, leave a review, and share. We'd love to hear what you enjoyed and your ideas for future episodes. See you next week. Next, I'll study how the workplace is craving for a more inclusive workplace and what is really stopping us from building a more equitable workplace. I'll see you next time. This is Monica Kang at Dear Workplace.